1956. Look around and see a world changing, a booming U.S. economy, a rapidly expanding population. Banks, businesses, governments, and industry, the institutions of modern life, struggle to keep up with avalanches of data. The business world relies on electromechanical machines to process bills, take inventory, keep ledgers, and do payroll. Machines are wired by hand for each task. Punched cards, stacks of them, are used to store and input data. The process is labor-intensive, but computers are still far too expensive for most businesses. Mid-range stored program computers lease for $10,000 a month. The fastest computers cost millions. IBM is the global leader in business machines. Despite its 80% market share, the company is under pressure. In France, IBM's new design for a worldwide accounting machine is too expensive, leaving IBM with no product to challenge competitors. In the US, IBM machines are popular, but use vacuum tubes, an aging technology. Transistors are the next big thing. IBM tells its engineers it's time to change. Systems must be solid state in 58. But there are risks. IBM earns enormous profits from punched card customers who may not want to convert. Customers will need training to program using a computer. They may not adapt. Despite this, the decision is made to pursue a cost-effective new computer system, one that incorporates many of the ideas from the never-produced worldwide accounting machine, the 1401. The driving force was new technology. Fran Underwood was the architect. We, of course, immediately began to, began to define not just the architecture, but the, what became the 1401 system. The 1401 design team commits to four targets. We began to define what function do we need. The 1401 will be a stored program computer with three basic parts, a central processor, a fast, high-quality printer, and a card reader and punch for input-output. What cost and price do we need? The basic system must lease for $2,500 per month, a typical price point for punched card equipment, but unheard of for a stored program computer. We also focused on simplicity. Most of the industry has no experience with computers. The machine must be simple for an easy transition. And finally, schedule. That was more or less uh, as soon as possible. IBM plans to unveil the 1401 in a closed circuit TV broadcast on October 5th, 1959. This design required a lot of art. You just had to invent stuff and take it on faith that it was going to be all right. We were converting from decades old acceptance of wiring panels. And at that time, stored programming was coming into the field. These are our goals and we're not changing them. Shell came in and said, my God, this thing is a blockbuster. It's going to sell thousands of these things. We decided that this was so big, we really had to go big. As the tape date approaches, there's a problem. At that time, the world inventory of 1401s consisted of a machine in the test lab. And if we took it out, we'd blow the schedule. The team can't risk moving its only working prototype to a TV studio. A mock-up is hastily assembled and those tape drives were spinning like crazy. By the engineers standing behind them and spinning them by hand. And battery-operated lights flash on an empty box. And that's how we filmed it. 50,000 people tune in for the debut of the 1401 Model Number 1. Model Number 2 is unveiled at Hanover Fair in Germany and demonstrated on a cross-country tour of Europe. It's a major success. 3,000 orders pour in in the first month. Big customers like Time Life modernize, replacing millions of punch cards with magnetic tape accessed through a 1401. For the first time, smaller businesses can afford computers. The 1401 is a smash hit across hundreds of industries and applications. Newsreels explain the very idea of computing to the general public. In 1964, the whole world watches as the 1401 Ramac churns out scores at the Winter Olympics. 
Sales and lease agreements pour in. The 1401 is the first computer to exceed 10,000 units. By 1965, nearly half the computers worldwide are 1401 models. But the dawn of a new era gradually gives way to the hard light of competition. Other companies pounce with clones and upgrades. IBM itself announces the System 360 in 1964. The market matures, and in 1971, the 1401 line is discontinued. It's an incredible run for a computer, but the 1401 gradually fades away. In 2003, a 1401 shows up on an auction website. It's been out of use for 30 years and is in sad shape. No one bid on it, but one of the volunteers at the museum here brought it to the attention of the museum. At the museum, we saw the potential of recreating a 1960s-era punch card computing environment for visitors to explore. The IBM 1401 was the ideal machine to feature. The old 1401 is crated and shipped to 1401 Shoreline Boulevard, the Computer History Museum. But will the CompuSore run again? Robert Garner volunteers to find out. I had no idea how to do that. I uh, scratched my head. Someone said, there's this thing called the IBM Retirement Newsletter. You might put an ad there. I thought nothing would happen. A week later, two dozen people call and say, I want to help. Former 1401 customer, manufacturing, and design engineers step forward, and restoration begins. 20,000 hours, 500 work sessions, Five years of corroded leads, leaky transistors, hunting down and machining worn out parts. But by fall 2004, the 1401 runs a simple diagnostic program. By 2008, it's fully operational. In time for a 50th anniversary celebration attended by members of the original design team. By bringing a half century old machine to life, kids and the visitors really feel like a time travel experience. And if they can go back 50 years so easily in time, maybe they can go forward 50 years just as easily. And that's what we try to capture. Thank you.